the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this short confession, I, by virtue of my office, is called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in his stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Almighty and merciful God, by your gift, alone your faithful people render true and laudable service. Help us and vastly to live in this life according to your promises and finally obtain your heavenly glory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. The Old Testament lesson for this, the 12th Sunday after the Trinity, is written in the 29th chapter of the prophet Isaiah, beginning at the 17th verse. It is not yet a very little while until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest. In that day the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind shall see, and the meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exalt in the Holy One of Israel. For the ruthless shall come to nothing, and the scoffers cease, and all who watch to do evil shall be cut off. Who by a word make a man out of an offender, and lay a snare for him who reproves in the gate, and with an empty plea turn aside him who is in the right. Therefore thus says the Lord, who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob, Jacob shall no more be ashamed. No more shall his face grow pale, for when he sees his children, the work of his hands in his midst, they will sanctify my name. They will sanctify the Holy One of Jacob, and will stand in awe of the God of Israel. And those who go astray in spirit will come to understanding, and those who murmur will accept instruction. This is the word of the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. The epistle lesson is written in the third chapter of St. Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth, beginning at the fourth verse. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ towards God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us confident to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now if the ministry of death, carved in letters of stone, came to such glory, that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness much far exceed in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has, no, has now come to no glory at all, because of the glory that surpasses it. For if... What was being brought to an end with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Alleluia. Sing aloud to God our strength. Shout for joy the God of Jacob. Alleluia. written in the seventh chapter of St. Mark, beginning at the 31st verse. Glory be to thee, o Lord. Jesus returned from 
the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee, through the region of the Decapolis, and they brought to him a man who was deaf and had an impediment of speech. And they besought him to lay his hand upon them. But taking him aside from the multitude privately, he put his fingers into his ears and spat and touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said, Epitha, that is, be open. And his ears were open, his tongue was released, and he spake plainly. And he charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. Even he makes the deaf to hear and the dumb speak. This is the gospel of the Lord. God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation, came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeded from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come.
ears open? It's a really good question, isn't it? I mean, a really good question. In 1846, in Vienna, Austria, a large number of women were dying and children were dying in uh, the General Hospital in Vienna, Vienna's General Hospital. In the General Hospital, it was interesting, they had two mater maternity wards. One maternity ward was run by midwives, had a very low infant mortality rate, mother mortality rate, and the other was, was run by the doctors. And the one that had the doctors in charge had a very high um, mortality rate, somewhere around uh, 56% of all the women and children that went in there died. And so it was so bad that the women, the Viennese women, would, would line up to go to the hospital to deliver their babies. They would often, if they were refused the clinic, the good clinic, the one the midwives ran, they would literally give birth to their babies in the street because it was safer to give birth to babies in the street than it was to go into this clinic that the doctors were in charge of. You see, because the Vienna General was a teaching hospital where doctors learned their trade by cutting up cadavers. And they often delivered the babies after dissecting corpses. So they would go in the morning, they would dissect corpses, and then they would go right into the maternity ward and deliver babies. And in 1847, doctors didn't wash their hands. In fact, they didn't even wash their uh, surgery uh, clothing. They, they, they would leave the stains and all the marks on there for their whole career. So they were kind of like badges of honor. The more blood stains, the more stuff you have on your, on your, on your surgery uh, clothing. That that was kind of like you know showed you how much showed everybody else what kind of how much experience you had. Well, there was a, one doctor, a Hungarian by the name of Ignaz Semmelweis. He started to wonder why all these women and children were dying from fever. After, after having um, been delivered in this, in this uh, maternity ward, and, and, and he thought maybe that there was a connection between the corpses and the women in labor, and, and, um, and he was criticized by the medical community. Edward Carl Edward Marius Levy, a Danish obstetrician, for instance, wrote that some of his, quote, beliefs are due to too unclear. Observations are too volatile. His experiences are too uncertain for deducting a scientific result. Semmelweis's speculations are too radical. And yet, from a clinical point of view, Semmelweis's had great data, right? And he had great data to support his hypothesis that there must be a connection between cutting up cadavers and, and, and the women giving birth, dying. And so, he, because he was in charge of the hospital, he instructed all the doctors they were to scrub in and scrub out of surgery, and they were to scrub in and scrub out of delivering children. Again, doing that, 1848. So in, in May of 1848 um, to June of 1848, they went from a 56% uh, percent, uh, death rate among women and children giving, you know, you know, being delivered and women giving birth in the maternity ward run by the doctors to just 2% in one month. For the next two years, it's speculated that, up to, up, that at least 500 women, their lives were spared by this, by them actually washing their hands and changing their surgery clothing. Well, do you think the medical community of, of Europe and the world just embraced that, you know? Oh, wow, look at this. We, we actually wash our hands and everything, but people will not die so much. No, no, no. In, in 18... In 1849, Semmelweis was tricked into going to an insane asylum where he was put in a straitjacket and beaten to death. And within a, within a few months, the doctor stopped washing and stopped changing their clothing, and um, infant and mother mortality went up 600%. And it wasn't for at least another 50 to 60, 70 years until that changed, when doctors began washing their hands at the turn of the next century. Edward Lister. The establishment, the medical establishment, their ears were not open to hearing the truth about hand washing. They preferred to defend the status quo by murdering the messenger, civil vice, and continuing their practice.
practice that led to the objective death of many, 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 many thousands of women and children. So, I guess the question we have to ask ourselves, are our ears open to the truth? In today's gospel lesson, they brought him one who was deaf, who had an impediment of speech, and they begged him to put his hand on them. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers in his ears, he spat, he touched his tongue, and then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Epitha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was loosed, and he spake plainly. Epitha, be opened. Be opened. And is this not the problem, really? Just as with, with Semmelweis, are our ears open? Is it not our openness, or rather lack thereof, to the truth that is the problem? Right? The, the, the Austrian uh, philosopher Karl Popper, logician Karl Popper, once said that if you ask me how do you know something, my reply is I don't. I only propose to guess. And if you are interested in my problem, I shall be happy if you will criticize my guess and offer counterproposals, and then I, in turn, will try to criticize them. In other words, what he's basically saying is what Solomon says in the Proverbs, that iron sharpens iron, and from the multitude of counsels is wisdom discerned. But we don't like our preconceived ideas challenged, do we? We don't like that. That's why in Western civilization, right, Western civilization, the idea of challenging ideas or interacting ideas has become something that is really becoming greater more and more every year forbidden. That's why censorship is rising across all Western countries like a kudzu that covers even the homes. It's become a matter of state policy. And socially, a man can lose or a person can lose friendships and family, family relationships over differing opinions over ideas that were once thought safe to discuss. One treads on thin ice with one's own family and friends and neighbors to discuss anything. And why is this? It's because our ears are not open, is it not? I mean, Jesus says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. But notice Jesus says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Do we have ears to hear? Too often. Are we not like those whom Isaiah describes when he says, Hearing you will hear, and shall not understand, and seeing you will see, and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes are closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. Is Isaiah, could he not as easily be describing American Christianity? Yeah, I think so. Because you see, the first test yeah. when a human being interacts with any bit of information is not the veracity of the information, but the, the truthfulness of the person. I mean, people, I mean, God can give us his word. I mean, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by him. And he can speak his truth to us all day long, but if we are not truthful, we will not hear it. That's why Jesus said in his parable, the rich man and Lazarus, right? Jesus said that if, that if your brothers will not receive Moses and the prophets, it will not matter if somebody comes back from the dead. And Jesus did. He came back from the dead. The world does not believe him. Mm -hmm. It clings to lies. We cling to lies. And are deaf to God's word, aren't we? I mean, more than we'd like to admit. I know I am. Furthermore, what I find compelling in today's gospel lesson is how the deaf man found Jesus. You know how he found him? He didn't. 
He didn't find him. But I just, it's very interesting, isn't it? They brought him to him. They brought him. Others brought him to Jesus. He didn't bring himself. Right? As Luther points out, it's not, we do not come to Christ through our own reason or strength. But we are called by the gospel of life with his gifts. And that's exactly what you see in today's gospel lesson. He is called by the gospel and enlightened by his gifts. For those who brought Jesus were no doubt called by him. I mean, we are all here in this room for that reason, are we not? It's not because we're so wonderful, you know, we, you know, stuck our thumb in a plum and pulled, you know, stuck our thumb in a pie and pulled out a plum or something. What a good little boy and girl are we? Or something like that, a little boy, good boy am I? Right? We're here because someone brought us to Christ, because somebody brought the word to us that faith comes by hearing. I mean, that's what happened. Someone brought us to the presence of Christ. I know that's true for me. And in Christ's presence, the Holy Spirit creates faith where and when it pleases the Lord. Which leads to the second important observation of where is Jesus? Where is Jesus is where salvation is found. And where is Jesus found? Because the church is invisible, is it not? But the church does have marks. And what are the marks of the church? The marks of the church are where the holy gospel is being preached in purity and truth. And where the sacraments are celebrated according to the gospel. Right? I mean, one of the reasons why in this parish at least we use the traditional liturgy, the historic liturgy, is because it's, it's basically all God's word. And so it, the whole liturgy, the whole worship service is, is an articulation of the gospel and its purity and truth. Right? It's where Christ's gospel is proclaimed, where the sacraments are celebrated according to the gospel. Christ is there. We know this because Jesus himself told the apostles, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am in the midst of them. Christ is in this place. He is in our midst. Why? Because Jesus Christ, according to John's Gospel, is the Word that became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. The word glory means worship. We became we beheld His glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace, grace, and truth. Here we receive grace. We receive the gifts that we do not merit. We receive the mercy and the forgiveness that we do not deserve. Right? We receive it in absolution when we confess our sins and God absolves us our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We receive it in the waters of holy baptism where we are born again of water and the spirit and we see and taste and touch it under the veils of bread and wine in holy communion. Right? We receive grace and we receive the truth of God's word. Right? That's what we receive. Yes, because Jesus' word is here. He is here, and the place is full of his grace and full of his truth. Grace and truth that, like the healed man who could not hear but then could hear, we cannot but help proclaim. We proclaim this gospel, this, this Christ and his gospel to us. By our attendance, did you know that? By, by merely being here, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes as you receive his sacrament under the veils of bread and wine and get them to the Lord's Supper. And as you are here, you are confessing to the world that what happens here is important and matters. Yes, you are confessing Christ before men. And Jesus says that whoever confesses me before men, I, him, I will confess before my Father who art in heaven. In the name of Jesus.
see all of you here this morning. Um, just know the blue news for this week. Uh, the main things that are coming up this week in the parish are on Tuesday evening, we have elders at 6, uh, council at 7, and then, of course, uh, Bible study at, at 6 a.m. on Friday as well. Um, just want to let you know that Beth Cornmayer is no longer at Saad, um, Saad uh, Hospice in Mobile. Some call it sad, but it's uh, she did uh, die yesterday morning at 5.30 in the morning. So the Cornmayers are looking to have a memorial service for her probably the 14th of September is what uh, Kevin told me at, at Bible class this morning, Sunday school this morning. So just kind of let you know on that. Um, also, yesterday we had a funeral service or a memorial service for, for Bonnie uh, Smith, and uh, we continue to pray for the Smith and Cote families as they mourn the death of Bonnie, and also we will pray for the Corn Mayors and the Grosses as they mourn uh, for uh, Beth Corn Mayor, Ruth Gross's daughter. And uh, I'm trying to think, uh, also um, from the first service, LaDonna uh, Stallworth asked that we pray for the Mitchell and Stallworth families as well. Lord be with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace that is from above and for the well-being of the churches of Christ. And the godly unity of Christendom, let us pray to the Lord. The Lord have mercy. For this holy house, and for those who in faith, piety, and the fear of God offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. The Lord have mercy. For Matthew and Eric, our shepherds and bishops in Christ, for all pastors and teachers, and all people, let us pray to the Lord. The Lord have mercy. For, uh, for the sick and the sorrowing, for those who mourn, for those who are in need of distress, for the homebound and the infirm. Especially we pray this day for Alice and Woody and Cloyce, for Barbara and Deborah and Melissa and Joyce, for, for Tony and Beth, for, for Dennis and Barbara, George and Shirley, Chris and Elmer, Janice and Taylor, for Melissa and Gray, Bob and Meredith, James and George and Larry Dean and Earl, for Suzette and Mallory, Mark and Hank, Jay and Tracy, Michelle and Carl, Karen and Jimmy and Tina and Kevin, for Ron and Jesse and Theo and Waylon and Ryan. We also pray for the families of our parish who mourn, especially the Cornmere family, the Smith family, the, uh, uh, the uh, Anderson family, the Simmons family, the Triumph family, and the Kinner family. We also pray, Heavenly Father, also for those in service to our country's armed forces, especially Riley, Paul, Hayden, Paul, and Will, and all of our university students, including Aiden, Kelsey, and Mia. We pray, Heavenly Father, also for those to whom death is drawing near and for us all, that when our last hour shall come, we may depart this life in the confidence of the sure faith, the consolation of a right to God and holy hope, and in the communion of Christ's holy church. Let us pray to the Lord. For calling those who have gone before us in the faith, and rejoicing to share with them the Sabbath rest which Christ has won for his people, that together with them we may be found faithful in the day of judgment, and rejoice the day of the resurrection of the dead. Let us pray to the Lord. We pray especially this day for, um, for the uh, Mitchell and Stallworth families. Lord God, Heavenly Father, look down from heaven, visit and relieve uh, the Mitchell and Stallworth families for whom we offer up our supplication. Look upon them with the eyes of thy mercy and give them comfort and sure confidence in thee. Defend them from the dangers of the enemy and keep them in perpetual safety and peace. Through the merits of Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We also pray for those who mourn. Um, Lord God, have we have compassion, Lord, upon all who mourn, and upon all who are lonely and desolate because of the death of Beth and, and uh, Bonnie, and also those who mourn the death of John, and all others, Heavenly Father. We pray that you would be thou their comforter and friend, and give unto them earthly solace, and 
as thou seekest to be best for them, and bring them to a full knowledge of thy love, and wipe away all their tears. For the sake of Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen.